All righty. Hello, everybody. My name is Maggie Case, and I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. And I am just thrilled to welcome you to this evening's author interview on the book, The Shivers Multiphone Story by John Bennett. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and our Log House Museum are located on the traditional land of the Duwamish people past and present. We are grateful to the Duwamish, Seattle's first people for stewarding this land through the generations. I'd also like to thank our sponsors who make programs like these possible, including Four Culture, Luna Park Cafe, Alki Beach Academy, and Home Street Bank. And of course, thank you so much to all of you for your support. I'm so glad you can join us tonight. I know many of you made a contribution to support our programming this evening, and we are so grateful to you. If tonight's presentation inspires you to support the mission of the Historical Society, which is to preserve and promote our local history, I'd encourage you to visit our website, www.loghousemuseum.org, to learn more about how you can support the Historical Society through a donation, membership, or as a volunteer. We can't do this without you, and we're so grateful for your dedication to your history and the community you call home. With all that being said, I'm going to introduce our speakers tonight. I'm sure for many of you, Clay Eels and John Bennett need no introduction, but in case this is your first time with the Historical Society, Clay Eels is a longtime supporter of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society since its founding in 1984, notably including a tenor, tenure as executive director from 2013 to 2017. Clay's work with the Historical Society also includes serving as the president of the board of directors, succeeding the organization's founder, Elliot Cowden. Outside of the Historical Society, Clay served for five years as the editor of the West Seattle Herald and White Center News, 13 years as an editor and writer for Fred Hutchinson Cantor Cancer Research Center, five years as communication officer for the Encompass Children's Services nonprofit in North Bend, and two years as a journalism teacher and advisor at South Seattle College. Clay also edited and directed production of the first local history book related to West Seattle and White Center, West Side Story, published by Robinson Newspapers in 1987. For the past three years, he and Jean Sherrard have shared the role of now and then columnist for Pacific Northwest Magazine of the Sunday Seattle Times, a column which was founded and maintained for its first 37 years by historian Paul Dorpat. So thank you so much, Clay, for being here. John Bennett has been a contributing member of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society since 1997 and has served on the board for a number of years. Through Luna Park Cafe, John has been a longtime supporter of the Historical Society and has been absolutely instrumental in the initial restoration and ongoing maintenance of our Log House Museum. With a background in theater work and antiquing, John has always found ways to work with his hands. His first antique shop, Jukebox City, was in Pioneer Square in the 80s. He started investing in properties and slowly transitioned to architectural restoration and preservation work. In 1988, he built and opened the Luna Park Cafe in West Seattle, leading to his first foray into vitalizing a lost and forgotten neighborhood corridor. John is a recipient of the King County Historical Organization's Charles Payton Award for Heritage Advocacy. He is a contributing member to Historic Seattle, where he's taken part in their learning labs, community discussions, as well as the first interurban event. And he's also received the Community Investment Award in 2014. And of course, the reason we're all here tonight, John is also the author of the Shivers Multiphone Story, which was released in the fall of 2021 and documents the fascinating history of a little known precursor to the jukebox, the Shivers Multiphone, which was a Seattle based invention. I'm really excited to learn more about it this evening. And Clay, I will turn it over to you now. Okay. Well, um, this is going to be a multimedia experience tonight. And this is one of John Bennett's favorite songs. It's appropriate for a jukebox. Good old Louis Armstrong. And this is not going to be something where I'm going to be reading from a script, but I am going to be reading something pretty quickly here, very briefly about John. This is a real treat for me um, because I get to mess around with John Bennett. And one way I'm going to do that is I want to read a short tribute to him that I wrote a couple of years ago. 
that uh, that that people at our historical society gala heard, and then I think it bears repeating given the occasion tonight. Um, John Bennett is first and foremost a friend. He's a friend to all of us on this on this Zoom session. He's a friend of historic preservation. He's a friend of the most colorful and beat up of memorabilia. He's a friend to everyone who loves history and most loyally a friend to West Seattle. And I deeply appreciate that. We all do. He's the very definition of approachable. When you look up down to earth in the dictionary, you will find John's name. You might even find him in the listing for integrity. The same goes for indefatigable. The guy wears his heart for history on his sleeve and he also is ageless. And you know, a lot of ways to describe him. Who else brought to life countless used jukeboxes that were given up for dead? Who else was there hands-on for the countless physical tasks of restoring what became our log house museum in 1997, even touching the place up with wet paint in the final minutes before its grand opening ceremony? Who else is behind the scenes of keeping our museum ship shape year after year after year? Who, who else financed the crucial buttons and the banners for our We Love the Junction campaign that culminated in the 2017 landmarking of the two crown jewels of the West Seattle Junction? Who else owns and lovingly maintains the coolest buildings in Georgetown? Who else created and has kept alive for more than 30 years in spite of countless odds, the funky, down-home, ultra-retro, and let's face it, inaccurately named Luna Park Cafe? Who else has been the longest running sponsor of the Historical Society's Champagne Gala brunch? And who else rose from the near ashes of a disastrous motorcycle accident several years ago to work and thrive and wear the brightest smile in creation? Uh, they broke the mold when they made John. And uh, you can be sure though, that if anyone were to find that broken mold, and restore it and display it for the public, it would be none, owner, none other than our own John Bennett. So thank you, John, for letting me uh, take part in this with you on this occasion of your book. This is a real thrill. Um, I think uh, it's Im important for people to know about you before we get into the book. And, you know, a few people know that that you're a locksmith in your early days and uh, and very soon developed a general interest in all kinds of old stuff, particularly jukeboxes. Tell us how you got into that. Why did why did would a guy so young get into something, with, you know, all these things that are so old? Well, that's a good question. Well, for, first of all, Clay, yes. thanks for that. Okay. I, I so thanks for all those nice words. And, and you said I was ageless. I, lately, I don't feel very ageless, but uh, um, I appreciate that. Um, so I started out, I came to Seattle when I was 19 years old. As a, and the only skill I knew was locksmithing. And I worked in Rainier Valley, Mount Baker, and I ended up being in a lot of old houses that had basements full of junk. And um, uh, as the years went by, um, people would give me stuff out of their basement. And I just kind of got interested in antiques. I'm not really sure how. My friend um, lived up in the North End and invited me out one time for dinner. And he had a 1936 Wurlitzer jukebox in there. And he goes, hey, look at this I just found. And I had no idea what it even was. I thought it was a radio. And, you know, he played a, a song on it. And um, uh, just at that point, I was stuck. So when I got out of locksmithing, I... I opened up an antique shop and I sold all sorts of antiques, but my specialty was kind of jukeboxes, which eventually um, I uh, started just specializing strictly in jukebox restoration, repairs, and sales. And Had you of. ever known what a jukebox was before that? Well, you know, I people ask me, you know, do you, do you remember jukeboxes as a child? And I do remember one in... Uh, place called Camp Washington Pizza where I grew up in the DC area and I remember a jukebox being in there and I remember playing the jukebox but um, you know there weren't there weren't in the 70s jukeboxes were starting to 
fade out a little bit. And so there weren't a lot of jukeboxes out. Plus, you know, I was young and, and most of the jukeboxes were in bars, which I couldn't get into. God knows <laughs> I tried, but. You know. <laughs> um, so, so what's the magic of a jukebox for you? You know, you're 19 years old. What makes them cool? Well, you know, I always say, and people ask me when I was shop, I said, would they ask that question? And, and the, the thing about a jukebox is, is, is visually, they're beautiful. I mean, they're, they're works of art. Plus, they sound great. So you, it's like a win-win situation. So um, I just, I don't know, I just, the style of, I just fell in love with, with the music. Uh, it was a great way to learn about old music. I'd work on jukeboxes. I'd have a stack old 78s. And I'd play them, and I'd, I'd, I'd learn about you know, different artists from the 40s and 50s and Glenn Miller. And it, it was just, it was just amazing that King Cole. And so I just, I just kind of fell in love with him and I turned kind of a hobby into a, um, into a, uh, a business. Did that for many years. So here we're looking at some of your favorite jukeboxes. And I mean, a lot of people remember driving up down, up and down First Avenue and there's Jukebox City. Um, how did you end up downtown with Jukebox City? Well, I was, uh, I was in West Seattle um, uh, at where the little uh, coffee shop is next to Luna Park Cafe for years. And then I, I was able to buy the business where, I don't know, you have to be old to remember this, but it was Pat and Ron's Tavern was there before Luna Park Cafe. Uh -huh. Pretty terrible tavern, second only to the Delridge Tavern, which <laughs> died about the same time. But um, uh, I bought that building and I moved into the where Avalon Glass and my office is now, and I had Jukebox City there, and just almost immediately outgrew it. And so I needed, I actually, you know, ironically, just needed a cheap place to have a warehouse building and have my my shop, and I bought a building down on First Avenue, Soto District. Um, well, West Coast Paper was leaving the area, moving to the Kent Valley because the kingdom had been built. They couldn't get their trucks in there. And so I got a cheap building. There was 27,000 square feet. And uh, I thought, how, what am I going to do with all this room? Well, within two years, I, it was full. You know, at the one time, I think I had 800 jukeboxes or something crazy. But um, um, I just, uh, you know, that it was just a, a good place to be. It was a cheap place to be as opposed to now, which is, you know, Nothing, nothing in soda is cheap anymore. It's pretty. pretty so you, you, you could walk into Jukebox City down there uh, and, and see some of the things that we're seeing right now. You said they're beautiful. That's part of their appeal to you. Describe their beauty. What is it that's really pulling you in when you see a jukebox? Well, you know, jukeboxes were designed to not be, you know, the ugly duckling in the corner. Jukeboxes were designed for people to go, holy moly, what's that? And run over to it and look at it, look at the bubbles and the changing colors and the design. I mean, Wurlitzer actually hired a designer in the 40s to design their jukeboxes. And so they, they, they wanted to, they wanted them to attract people, get people over there to put their nickel in them. So, I mean, they've done just about anything. Even in this picture, you can see like the ones in the center are the 40s jukeboxes and they bubble and change colors and they have beautiful orange Catalan plastic with walnut cabinets, they're works of art. And whereas the one to the far, I guess, left is a, a 50s machine, which looks like it has 1957 uh, Chevy <laughs> uh, light fins on, you know, and so like uh, life imitated art, jukeboxes limit imitated life, and so anything to get them over there, and, and they, you know, they spent a lot of time making them attractive, so I mean, you just, there's hardly a, until the 70s when they started getting ugly, there's hardly a, an ugly jukebox out there from the 40s or 50s. So you are a jukebox guy and, a, and an old stuff guy, here you are at a trade show, in California in the 1980s. See what, what I meant by ageless? Uh, yeah, that's and, called uh, a mullet. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, you're, you're bumping along selling antiques and you end up bumping into something that really nobody ever really knew about. Um, and I mean, nobody at the time knew about, but they were very popular. You could call them a precursor, but they also came along at the same time as jukeboxes because these these jukeboxes obviously were playing 78s, right? Uh, but yeah. there was a, a new thing. And I didn't know about it really until your book. And it's called the multiphone. 
and just to give people an introduction to it, I think we ought to uh, play for them this terrific three minute piece on Evening Magazine that ran, uh, ran a year ago. And we'll, we'll roar along with this and then we'll get into the details afterward. Here we go. Ugh, this is gonna take forever. What? Seriously? Here we go. It was an ear-catching idea. Really a unique system. Back before World War II, Seattle pinball inventor Ken Shivers came up with the original streaming music service. 1939, he's doing Pandora. At a time when coin-operated jukeboxes were spinning the latest hits in bars and restaurants, Shivers figured out a way to expand the offerings. The jukebox was playing 20, 24 records. This is playing 170 plus records. Collector and historian John Bennett says the Shivers multiphone was an idea ahead of its time. You put a nickel in, put it in, and it would ring down the station. From a downtown studio packed with turntables and records, a young woman with a pleasant voice would take your request. Number, please. And you'd say, well, I want number 132, and she would go grab the record and put it on the turntable, and it would play over the speaker and the multiphone, and they also usually had speakers throughout the business. At its peak, the Shivers Multiphone could be found in 120 locations across Washington. Seattle, Tacoma, Bremerton, and Spokane. And the girl DJs, as they were called, became objects of fantasy. You know, they say sex sells. When you were selecting your music, it was personal. You were talking directly to the woman that was going to play the record. There were strict on-the-job guidelines for the women, who were forbidden to accept dates from smitten customers. They couldn't use their real name. They had to have mic names, as they call it. For some reason, many went by Mabel. And when military brass needed to get sailors on shore leave to return to their ship, they asked the Mabels to step up to the mic. And make an announcement over every location. Shivers himself was as quirky as his invention. You know, just right to the point or get out of my face. He was always looking for the next big idea, and the inventor thought he'd come up with a good one. He had a patent for a combination ashtray spittoon. In 1959, Shivers left the music biz behind. I'm done, moving on. As for those 8,000 multiphones? No more than 1,500 survived. Some were turned into lamps long ago. Others simply scrapped. Now they're kind of rare and desirable and uh, really hard to find at this point. The multiphone has been silent for more than 60 years, but it still tells a story about one man's great idea set to music. He was just way ahead of his time. So Jim, as someone who just... All right. Today is an important Oops. day at Overlake because today... This is called Seat of the Pants. <laughs> Um, so we are now into the story. We have a good introduction to this, but I think the real introduction is the story that you need to tell us all about how you came into contact with what a multi-phone is. And it's, and it's an incredible story that's told in the book. You, it, you didn't just run across one multi-phone, uh, you ran across multi 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 phones tell us yeah, about that <laughs> that's true well i um you know what to get my inventory for my store i would hit uh, old operators an operator is uh someone who ran who operated jukebox pinballs that kind of thing there's also distributors and there's a distributor in seattle and i uh -huh. would go there and they'd sell me what they would call old equipment which would be just old jukeboxes and parts and stuff and um i would go in there and there is these multi-phones everywhere and I never really gave them a second look um you know they were cool but I I didn't have any interest in them and uh, well and you I, also mentioned they, they they didn't they didn't look like what they were many of them were lamps right? yeah they they were um the one salesman there my fr friend the salesman he, he called them uh, pool table ornaments and they're all over the pool tables and and so anyway the guy that owned it was one day was just really hard selling me on them it's like oh you should buy all these you could have them in your store and sell them and people will love them and I 
you know, I kind of looked at him. I thought, well, I don't know. And, and then um, he just that gave me a deal, you know, offered me a deal I couldn't refuse. So I, I looked at him and I thought, okay, I bought him. And then uh, I, at the time I had a 1951 Chevy sedan delivery and um, I went and took them all off the pool table and um, jammed them in, in my truck. And I'm about ready to leave. And the, the warehouse manager goes, well, when are you going to get the rest? And I said, well, I think I got them all. And he goes, no, no, there's four pinball boxes up in the loft full of them. We'll get them down with the forklift and you can come back and get them. So like, uh, I think it was like four or five loads later, I had gotten them all out. And it was uh, like 450, I think I ended up getting. I was, I was thinking I was getting like 40 or 50 and I got 450. So um, I just- um, 450 of them. And we're looking at a picture of one, but we don't really have a sense of their scale. How is, if people look at the picture of you right now, yeah. you've got one sitting next to you. So it's like a little R2-D2. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not big. And they were, they were made to, to put on, um, on the, in the booth. Like if you've gone to Luna Park, we have wall boxes at all the tables to play the jukebox. And that was what these were, sat, sat on the booth, put your coin in. You didn't have to get up, you could put your coin in and play your okay. music. We'll get into the details of what is a multiphone and how does it works, but how does it work? But but first, pretty soon you got into who in the heck is this guy named Ken Shivers? Tell us about him. He's he's sort of an unknown character, but in the collector world, he's a legend. Yeah, well, you know, um, some people call him the inventor of the pinball machine, which is probably not necessarily absolutely true. I think he was one of the many people that started making. Pin what we think of as pinballs. Originally, they were called pin and marble games. It's basically just a wood cabinet. You shot a steel ball up, and it bounced off some nails and went into a hole, and you got points. Um, and uh, he uh, invented quite a few different ones. And you know, he was really good at the different designs. He had one that was called cannon fire, that the ball would go down and go up to a cannon, and the cannon would shoot it back up on the play field. Um, and he he was very successful in that. And he. Um, he, he he was an operator himself, so he would put all these pinball machines out on location. But Ken Chivers was from the Midwest, and he came out here, and he was just one of those guys that was, you know, mad scientist type guy that you could you talk to him, you know, he was just thinking a hundred different things. And talking to his granddaughters, they go, yeah, Grandpa Ken, you know, we, we'd be talking, and then all of a sudden he'd just go by and hang up because he'd have something else he wanted to do. It was like, you know, he was just really gruff. And like I said in that video, which I want to give a shout out to Jim Dever for doing that great video on, and his, um, he did, it was just, it was just great. So, but um, yeah, he was just always thinking something, but by the time he died, he had, he had had, he had, um, had 59 patents of different things, coin op stuff, all sorts of different games, everything. Um, and this was this picture here was one of my favorites. It was a combination floor, ashtray, and spittoon. So <laughs> you could either spit your tobacco in it or put your cigarette ashes in it. I imagine that was pleasant to empty. But um, <laughs> he had he was just a, he was just a genius. But um, he was also really feisty. He was you know he was involved in all sorts of lawsuits, and he just he you it wasn't a guy you could push around. So but. Super smart, super inventive guy. And how did you find out more about him? You you uh, you dug into the family, right? Right. Well, so you know, I had all these multiphones, and I was just you know selling them, and I didn't really think twice about them. And then um, his son um, uh, had the estate sale for his son, and I never even really thought much about it, Bob Shagers. But I went up to the the state sale and he still had a bunch of multi-phones and parts and stuff and I ended up buying them and then I just kind of got back into um into them and I, I had sold a lot of them and a lot of them had, were missing parts that I'd sold over the years and so a lot of the parts I got at this estate sale completed these machines so I helped a lot of people complete their their multi-phones and um I just started um thinking more about it and then I met his his daughter um uh, Bob Shivers, the son, Ken Shivers, son. I, I met his daughters, and uh, thank God one of them had. Oh well, here's Bob's box of photos and, and literature, and so I was able to go over there and spend a few hours digging through all that. And they were gracious enough to let me borrow it and reprint it in my book. Uh, but a lot of stuff like this picture here is Ken Shivers 
uh, before he made the multiphone, he was making a non-selective wall box for jukeboxes. Uh, originally jukeboxes came out, you just had to go to the jukebox and put a nickel in. But the idea was to keep people from leaving the bar or leaving their booth to just put a nickel in and play. And um, these were, you know, like I say, non-selective. So you just put a nickel in and it would play the next song on the, on the jukebox. But this was at a trade show probably in Chicago where he was selling these, these wall boxes, which he also invented. So. And and obviously he was a presence here in Seattle. I mean, on Second Avenue for quite a few years. Yeah, his main. This was his main station. You saw earlier a picture of the hostesses playing music. That was their their main um, state. Their main station, and um, in there would be. I think in Seattle they had like. I think on a busy time they'd have like six to eight hostesses in there playing and and. Uh, um, this is, by the way, to give you a reference, this is where the crocodile was on, on Second Avenue. In Belltown. Uh, the building is still there. Yeah. And, uh, anyway, so, but yeah, that was, that was his main station. And he, he was a, an operator. He, he had machines out. And he, I don't think, his, his multi-phone system, he never sold. He, he it was, it was proprietary. He did, he ran them all himself. So um, like a lot of, machines, pinballs, jukeboxes, slot machines, whatever, you know, people have made them, just sold them. But, but Bob ne or, um, uh, Ken never sold any of them. He, he just ran his own, he used them himself on his own routes. Now, now before, you know, we've been talking about the multi-phone and we're going to get into more detail in just a bit, but there was something before the multi-phone. It was this. Um, yeah, when, yeah, when he first started out, he actually made the music phone. People think the multi-phone because there's, uh, there's a lot of multi-phones out there. These are the music phones. And so they were his, his first patent. And um, um, so we'll probably get a little later into what exactly wired music is. But these first came out. And he, Ken's idea on, on his... Um, wired, what they call wired music, which is what this is, because it's not a joke. Well, I'm going to stop you because yeah. wired music, what you're talking about is 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 transmitting music through telephone wires, right? Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's what wired music was, and, and so, he, but he wanted a real personal system. So he, uh, the, a lot of the wired music that came out in the late '30s were actually you know, full-size jukeboxes that you walked up to and played where he was thinking like, no, I want them in every booth and on the bar, I want them everywhere. So people don't have to get up. They can just put their nickel in and, and play them. So this was his, his first one, the music phone. Um, but I would say probably all of these got scrapped during, probably during the war effort, you know, um, to make airplanes for the World War II. Um, but um, it, this was his first design. And then later on, he decided, like, if you see where at the top where it says Shiver's music phone, that was a transceiver. So you could, you would put your nickel in, talk, and the woman, the hostess at the end would say, your number, please. And then you would, you would talk back into, so talk back into that, say, I want number 137, Nat King Cole, you know, and um, they would, they would play it. But the, the multi-phone later on, he, he added a, speaker in the bottom so these the music would play out of speakers on the wall where the multi-phone is second uh design play music right at the booth so there's a little speaker there okay can... so we'll move to that you can yeah. see the speaker at the bottom there's another feature here um that if you look carefully at the top it says talk here it's almost it's an invitation to a personal experience <laughs> oh yeah well, some of the other um, wired music systems had microphones on it that, that, that said, uh, talk to me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was. Um, Very personal. The, the wired music was, was something that in the 30s, uh, the phone lines um, got started becoming a little more high tech and more common. You know, before the 30s, it was rare to have a phone line or you had party lines or that kind of thing. But by the 30s, they were stringing phone lines all over the United States and they were much better quality. So they could play music over and it was it was decent quality played over a phone line. So another aspect of this picture that, uh, that is a great illustration is is of the big advantage or one of the big advantages of a multi-phone over a traditional jukebox. You know, traditional jukebox, 
in a restaurant or a bar, it could play only the 78s that were there. But this is different. Tell how yeah. it's different. Well, it's, it's different because, well, for the biggest difference was, of course, that you can see all the selections here. Well, in 1939, jukeboxes played between 20 and 24 78 RPM records. That was your selection. Whereas this one, um, you know, they'd have, I think it was 180 on one of those, uh, on the, the um, cylinder turned. You can see the neurals down there. You could turn it and read the, the title strip. So you had, you know, you had much more selection. It wasn't just the this 20 selection. So it, it was it was that. And also another good thing about this was that when you have a regular jukebox that's playing records, you always have, you know, a record that's got a crack in it or skips or, or you know, the turntable isn't spinning the right. So th they didn't have to worry about any of the, the mechanics of a jukebox at separate locations. All the turntables were in one location. So if a record was chipped and skip, or would skip, they could get rid of it. They didn't have to go out, you know, bartender call them, hey, number 17, skipping, and they have to come out and replace it with that record. So it, in a lot of ways, it, I mean, it was way ahead of its time. And um, it was just a better, it was just a better way of doing things. Well, it, it certainly seemed like uh, it, it had a lot of appeal from the customer's point of view. And you know, if you look at a restaurant here, I think this is in Tacoma. Um, the 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 multiphones are right there on the counter, through where all those stools are, and uh, <laughs> it's just mind-boggling to think that you could talk into one of those and talk to a real person, and ha and have that person uh, personally put the record on for you. Um, and that and that's true. And that one thing that that Ken Shivers. Uh, and I have a, a, a pat. I have a lot of patents in, in the book, but there's there's one where he's writing about, you know, why he should get his patent. And one of the one of the things he said is he is really into personalized. It's personalized. You know, you're not putting a nickel in a jukebox and some machines playing a record. You're talking to a human being that's playing you a record. And he, you know, some of the other guys that came out with other systems. Um, that had separate like wall boxes like this. Most of them were just a jukebox in the corner, only one they played out of that. But some, they had some other systems that had multiple wall boxes like this, but they, they weren't personal. Like if you, if you talked, it would play on all of them. So if you're talking to this hostess on uh, like the, um, the other version, which was a solo tone, say everybody could hear you talking to her, you know, and then also you could put in your nickel on a solo tone and maybe someone else would talk to her and tell you, I want this. And you're going, well, that was my nickel. So, but his, he <laughs> developed a system because he was such a mechanical genius that it would only, you could only hear from that. You could only talk to the uh, hostess on the multi-phone and they could only hear you. And so it was very personalized. And this is a great picture from the Tacoma Tribune that, that it shows it was actually an article about modern taverns in Tacoma, and I believe it was 1951. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, obviously, it, it became very popular uh, during the 40s, uh, the World War II years, uh, and afterward. Um, and, and one of the appeals, as you said, is that you're going to be talking personally with somebody. And this is such a great photo. One of the in many, just hundreds of incredible images in your book. Um, imagine if you're a woman working at the Shiver's shop, um, are you going to be standing in those heels eight hours a day? <laughs> well, that's, that's the interesting thing. Of that. And this is actually a press photo from Shiver's himself. I have other photos in the book of hostesses, but this one was a press one. And I, I can't prove this but I'm pretty certain that these were actual models as opposed to the women that actually worked here. Because a lot of the other pictures, I mean, this is back in the day where people, you know, dress nice to go to work, even though you couldn't see them, you know. But I think a lot of them probably wore sweats and a sweatshirt rather than a fancy dress and heels and everything. But um, so I think that they were, this was a set up press photo that, but what they wanted is they wanted you to see this like, this, you know, if you're in a bar and you had a few beers, you think, this is the girl I'm talking to, you know, mm -hmm. this, I'm talking to a pretty girl right now. And um, so they wanted, they wanted you to think that all their hostess or these, you know, beauties, these models, these 
pageant winners, you know. Uh, the other thing interesting, if you look at this photo, you can see up above this where they had all the records and all these women had to, you know, memorize the numbers. So if you wanted Orange Colored Sky by Nat King Cole, the guy said, I want to hear Orange Colored Sky. You'd have to know that that was record number 259. Go grab it out of there. And um, so that's all the records up above. You can see them all, all lined there. And then um, you can see each one of these turntables would, would go to a separate location. So each one on the front would say like Joe's Tavern. The next one would be Bob Murray's Doghouse. And the next one would be, you know, the, the uh, you know, whatever bar and grill. And so that, so when the, the, the you would call in, there'd be a light that would come on and it would register how many coins you put in. And, the girl would take would go over there and and say your number please pull the record off the rack and play it so at, at a time and i talked to some of these hostesses we'll get into later but she said they said that sometimes every one of these turntables was going it was just a cacophony of you know they they weren't amplified but you could still hear them going you know acoustically going so and you know this this wasn't an easy job it looks it looks easy but um there's a whole page and a half of do's and don'ts for these women. And they are, some of them are about how to talk with people, but a lot of it is very technical stuff. I just want to read one of them from your book. Um, it, it's it's uh, the things you must know and do. Number seven, lower needle onto record gently. You are to watch this with an angle, with an eagle eye. The dropping of tone arm, even one quarter of an inch, may ruin a $1 needle, a $6.50 crystal, a 75 cent record. And if the needle is bent or broken, it will ruin every record it plays on. Not only this, but the music will sound terrible in location. We repeat again, concentrate your eyes on the hand that is lowering the needle and be careful. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fascinating in your book to see what it is like to, to be one of the workers here. And John, tell us about some of the, the rules that the hostesses had for, for uh, what they could and they couldn't say. Oh yeah, well, you know, they, you know, of course they wanted them all to be very pleasant, you know, um, and, and have, and they, they hired him, they, you know, he, they, he would hire them, they'd have, they had to have a nice voice, you know, and then because you're, you're not seeing them, but they have to have a, a nice voice, and um, Ken, Ken uh, was a, a kind of a taskmaster, you know, he didn't put up with much, and, you know, he, all the records they had, had tape around the edges, so they wouldn't chip them, when they're taking them out but yeah he would he would dock your pay and these guys these people weren't making that much but if you ruined a record or you ruined a, a needle or a turntable you know there was hell to pay um, <laughs> but uh um yeah there there was all there was all sorts of rules there was um one of the ones that i uh, i like the best there was one that says don't cheapen yourself or the system by making a date over the multi-phone system <laughs> and you have to realize and yeah. we get in this when we talk about the hostesses, we have to realize, I mean, this is, you know, World War II and these guys are back from the South Pacific and the at Bremerton Naval Yard. And they're, um, you know, they haven't talked to a woman in, you know, a long time and, and, and they're lonely and they're away from home in Oklahoma and they get on the multiphone and they go to the same tavern every night and they talk to the same Mabel. And, it's, it, and some of the hostesses would say like, you know, I felt more like a psychiatrist than a disc jockey. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of these guys were, you know, pretty, you know, injured from, you know, mentally injured and, and from the war. And, and they, they saw a lot of ugly stuff. So it was a nice voice that they could talk to and, and they would, you know, talk. Them, and talk them one, one of the nice things about your book is that you went the extra mile. You not only um, uh, did the historical research, but you got to talk with several of the hostesses themselves. There, here's one, how she looked back in the day and then today. Um, uh, what yeah. was it like interviewing these women? Well, so um, I talked to my friend Jim Dever of Evening Magazine and I was telling him I was, I want to, I was thinking about doing this book and I want to do more research and everything. So he said, well, we'll do an Evening Magazine feature on it. And towards the, we didn't see it, but at the end of the uh, that, they, he, he did a call out like, you know, if you know any hostesses or, or if you were one, please get a, get a hold of us. And so I had a total of like five 
that got a hold of me, but three that were that I went and I interviewed. And this is a Loretta Shepherd, um, and she lives in Tacoma, and she worked in the Tacoma um, uh, Shivers Central Station as a hostess or disc jockey, whatever you want to call them. And um, I was talking to her, and um, uh, she and I and she was telling me all all the different stories, and and um, she and she said, well. And I always asked him, I said, do you remember your mic name? And she said, oh, she goes, oh, ab absolutely. And um, she said, my mic name was Joyce, which was my middle name. But uh, the Shivers were very strict about, you know, protecting them from, you know, uh, get putting their name out or people, you know, stalking them or, or coming. And the, the, the address of the central station was top secret too. You couldn't give that, they didn't want. And even, even being top secret, she said she'd come in some days and there'd be boxes of candy, you know, two joys, you know, I'd hope to meet you someday and flowers. And they even had, um, you know, proposals over the multi-phone. But so anyway, I was talking to her and she goes, yeah, my, my uh, mic name was Joyce. And I, um, I found a bunch of old paperwork and there was an invitation for the Tacoma for Tacoma for a Christmas party. And they had, um, all the different hostesses, pictures of all the different hostesses on this the card. Um, and one of them's name was Joyce. And I said, I said, I'm going to say, I said, you have a cell phone? She goes, yeah. I said, I'm going to send you a picture. Tell me who this is. And I sent her that picture. She goes, oh, that's me. So that was her. And, uh, and this, this picture here was actually, she sent it back to me. She goes, this is my high school picture, senior picture, when I was working at Shiver's Multiphone in uh, wow. Well, there were other companies that did this stuff too, right, John? It's, the multiphone was not the only one. Yeah, there. The, when when people started figuring this out, Ken was Ken was kind of ahead of the game, but everybody jumped on the bandwagon, including the big four, which were the Wurlitzer, Rockola, Seberg, um, and um, um, I don't know. I can't say, but anyway, they. But it's in, they, it's in your book. But yeah, in, yeah. In, in, and and so they all we're... they they all jumped on because at the time they're thinking, oh my god, this is this is the future of vended music. You know, these jukeboxes are all going to be obsolete. We're going to be throwing them away. We need to jump on board with with this. So a lot of people came up with and with um, their different version of a wired music system, which of course always included a central station with you know, women with sure. beautiful voices playing the records. Um, and then um, is th this one you'll see is kind of interesting. It's, it's got a, um, a good shot of the central station and the yes. big time operator boss. But if you also look at the, the unit that's actually uh, like the Shivers multi-phone, but it is a, a full-size jukebox. And um, the, a lot of them, you know, like, then again, we talked about, you know, being attracted the, to the jukebox. A lot of the wired music systems were have big boxes, not much really inside them, but they, a lot of them had, you know, pictures on the front of beautiful girls, like the one I said, it said, talk to me, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, they really, they really wanted you to, you know, read the titles, put your coin in while you're looking at this beautiful girl, almost like a lot of them look like kind of the Varga style girls, you know, and, uh, and you, you're talking, you're going, okay, this is who I'm talking to. Right. So, we got John, um, can you uh, uh, take us up another, uh, you know, through the 50s in the sense of why didn't this stay on past 1959? What happened? Well, yeah, so, um, you know, the war happened. That's one thing that happened. Um, and after the war, uh, things um, started to peter out. And I'm not really sure. And I never, you know, I'll tell you one thing about writing a book like this is you can go down rabbit holes to the point where you look at your watch and you realize it's three o'clock in the morning. And what are you doing here going on the computer? Um, but, you know, I'm not, I, I know that, the the what what is commonly said is that um, by the fifties uh, jukeboxes started getting better. First of all, they started playing two hundred selections, which competed with the amount of selections on like the multiphone or, or any of the other um, wired music systems. Uh, the other thing is they came out with um, high fidelity, and so the sound was way better than music over phone lines. And then they came out in 1959 
with stereo. So the sound uh, of a booming jukebox, you know, high fidelity or stereo, really, really hurt the, the wired music system. Um, the other thing was, is that um, they, were con they were changing from 78 RPM records to 45 RPM records. So uh, you couldn't, you, if you had a wired music system and you had a central station and you had your shelves and shelves of 78s, well, by 19, late, by the late 50s, a lot of the artists weren't cutting anything on 78. So if you wanted to hear the top music of the time, you had to play 45. So a lot of the wired music companies just thought, well, I'm going to have to A, change all my turntables to 45 RPM, and I'm going to have to buy all 45 RPM records. I'm going to have to change out all the title strips on everything. And it was just, I think a lot of them bailed out. I have my conspiracy theory is I think that the big four, the some of the uh, jukebox companies, you know, probably put a lot of pressure on them politically or however they could to kind of run them out of business because uh, they were com competitive. But it was it was something that should never have gone out of business. It should have just evolved into basically what we have today. If you go into a, a modern tavern or bar today or, or restaurant and you walk up to the jukebox, it's the same exact thing, it's same wired music, except for now it's not wired, it's Wi-Fi or 5G music, but it's the same thing. Um, so it should have evolved into that, but for some reason it just didn't. And it is again today. So that's how it turned out. But Well, we're rounding third and headed to home. And okay. the last question I wanted to ask you is, okay, you're interested in this stuff, but why write a book? You hadn't written a book before. And as you just alluded to, it takes a lot of work. Why, what motivated you to go ahead to go the extra mile and put out a book to share this with other people? Well, um, let me just say, I'm not gonna quit my day job. <laughs> um, but um, I, you know, I guess one of the, the main reasons is that I, I just started doing a lot of research. And since Shivers was Seattle based and there's um, Shivers relatives still here. Um, and I, I just, uh, people that had dealt with Ken and his son, Bob and his son, Richard, um, I, just, I just kind of got really curious about what the history was. Of it. The other thing too, is that since I had so many of these and you know, I started um, you know, handing out parts and, to, to the people that needed parts for theirs. And everyone was asking me like, well, how did it work? And you know, when did it start? What kind of models were or that kind of thing? So I just thought, well, this is a way I can, you know, print this book so I won't have to tell everybody verbally how everything worked. And, and I, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people were just very interested. And a lot of people, I mean, most of the people that have these, you know, collectors, which, you know, jukebox collectors or coin-op collectors have one. And then also, they're really also popular with uh, telephone collectors. And there's a lot of people out there that collect telephones and telephone memorabilia, but they all wanted, they all wanted to know. So this way, I just thought, well, I'll write it all down. And so when I decided to do this book, I wanted it to be kind of technical for collectors, but I also wanted it to be, you know, readable for the average Joe that just wanted to know some history of a of a Seattle business and a, a technology that's, you know, pretty obsolete at this point. Well, I, I can tell you as an so-called average Joe uh, that this book is not just for uh, people who, who uh, might be, you know, just collectors or, or, or really down the rabbit holes that you're talking about. I think it's it's something of interest to anybody because it's it's telling the story of something that that we just don't know about. It doesn't it doesn't uh, it's it's fallen into uh, the realm of of something totally obscure that only a very few people know about. And you've really brought it to life, which is, I think, a real achievement. And um, I, I, I thank you for it, and I'm sure other people will too. Um, I think it's probably time to go to some Q&A. If there are any, I'm going to look in the Q&A and see what we've got. Carrie Korsgaard, John, asks, were they operational 24 hours a day? 
Yes, they were on, on all four stations. Yes. I would say that the, um, the Seattle station and the Bremerton station were probably the busiest since Bremerton had a shipyard over there. Um, they, they went as high as like six or eight hostesses working at a time down to like night shift would be like maybe one hostess. Um, but, you know, like Clay was saying earlier, you know, sounds like an easy job. It wasn't an easy job. When it got busy, they were running back and forth, grabbing records, trying to remember, you know, the numbers correlating to the song. And then I, I know the one woman I talked to that was, um, you know, you, you talked about how strict Ken was about the needles and the turntables and scratchy and everything. And um, they, he did not like to lose a record. And um, I talked to the one hostess in, um, in um, um, who worked in Bremerton and she said they would get to the point where or maybe it was the Seattle Seattle stage anyway they get to the point where they would only have a few copies of one record and it'd be real popular and there'd be you know they wouldn't have enough to go around so they'd take they'd have to the minute it got done playing on one turntable they would frisbee it over to the other hostess across <laughs> the room at the other table and I said well did Ken ever see you doing that she goes oh no no if, if we broke a record we were in big trouble so if he said you never broke a record but I find that hard to believe <laughs> well John um from the comments in the chat um you've really hit a home run tonight and uh I, I appreciate you doing this uh, with me, taking a chance on doing this with me. It was a lot of fun. And uh, thanks again, John. And thanks, thanks Maggie, for hosting this. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for that wonderful presentation. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and thank you as well to Four Culture, Luna Park Cafe, Alki Beach Academy, and Home Street Bank for their support. As a friendly reminder to you all, although the Lock House Museum is currently closed to the public, we are reopening soon. Um, so please visit our website at lockhousemuseum.org to, to explore our digital exhibits, view additional information about upcoming programs, and learn more about the reopening of the Lock House Museum next month. Thanks for joining us, and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon.